The following program is paid for by the ministry partners of the Hour of Power and viewers like you. Friends, would you hold your hands out like this as a way of receiving? Let's say this together. I'm not what I do. I'm not what I have. I'm not what people say about me. I am the beloved of God. It's who I am. No one can take it from me. I don't have to hurry. I don't have to worry. I can trust my friend Jesus and share his love with the world. Thanks. You can be seated. Today is the last sermon in a series on Avoda, where we ask the question, how can we find joy again in our work? How can we make it where the work that we do, the labor that we put our hands to, is life-giving? How can we make it where Monday through Friday isn't some horrible, you know, bad experience, so we're just working to some, you know, reward on the weekend, but that where we actually enjoy Monday, where we look forward to going into work? And I believe that all of us can have that kind of experience in our work, where we can have a joyful, life-giving, wonderful experience no matter what we're, we're doing. Do you believe that too? It's very often when we go to work, we think, well, I can't have that here. You know, I can see how that's hard when you're a manager or a boss or, or whatever, but you can. You can have friends. I think this is one reason why uh, the show The Office was such a success. Anybody seen that show? Uh, it's ended in 2013, but it's maybe one of the most successful sitcoms ever. I think it ran eight seasons, and it is hilarious and pretty clean, actually. It's funny because this office is a copy of a British version, which was done by Ricky Gervais. The British version is a lot dirtier, a lot shorter, and a lot darker. So the first one really is almost a satire of just how horrible work is in general, how worthless it is, how sad it is to go there. And, uh, and so the, the, the original show was very, just very, kind of a satire. And this one sort of starts that way. But then it takes this arc of like where it becomes less like this dark version and more like Cheers. Where these characters who are all very flawed and imperfect everyday people be, truly become good friends. It's such a simple premise. Well, today I want you to know that you can. And more, not only that you can, but that you might want to think about the idea that maybe it's God's calling on your life to be the first to do this. Very often we think, well, I'm not the boss, I can't do that. Or maybe if you're the boss, you think, well, I'm their boss. How could I be their friends? Well, we're going to talk about that today. First, you're a disciple of Christ, and there's a way to love your competitors. We say, you know, love your enemies, but a lot of us don't have enemies, you know. We have competitors, though, and that's God's call for you today. I want to challenge you in that way. Have you ever been um, yourself overcome by good? Have you ever been kind of in a bad place? You're not feeling good emotionally. Maybe you're really angry. Or maybe you're depressed. Or maybe you're just you know, doing something that's flat out wrong. And someone's response, you know, the normal response to that when you're caught is authority, power, discipline. And that's not always bad. But sometimes you, you run into a teacher or a crazy uncle or it's something like that who confronts your evil with good. That's an, that's an awesome experience. I bet it would be really fun to sit down and hear those stories, especially as kids when we had, you know, that grandma or that person who confronted our evil with good. One that always comes to my mind is when I started seminary. When I began at Fuller, I knew everything. Man, I was, I was a 25-year-old that knew everything. And uh, when the pastors at the, the church said, we're reformed, you have to get an education. I said, I've got an education because I got the Bible, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and I remember going into seminary, looking at all of these professors and all these students and just being like, I, 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 they don't have anything to teach me. It's terrible. I've grown since then. <laughs> and uh, no, but really, and just, and I'm actually embarrassed to say, to say all this, but I remember when one of my first systematic theology classes was taught by a really well-known uh, writer and thinker named Ray Anderson, very influential, studied under a famous theologian named T.F. Torrance. I think he went to St. Andrews. I'm looking at Tim, is that right? I don't know. But anyway, 
uh, maybe Cambridge, but he, he was just a just brilliant guy, and I was in his last class. He's now in his 80s. Everybody wants to take his class. I sort of stumbled into it randomly, and uh, I didn't know anything about this guy. I didn't care. I knew everything. And so I'm sitting there, and he's, it's a first class of systematic theology, and he's there preaching, or preaching, or teaching on something. And I start looking around. I'm like, are they hearing what he's saying? Are they here? What? What is he saying? What? And finally, in the middle of class, I full on stand up and I'm like, you're wrong. Like, just like, you know, I've, I'm, I'm like, you, I, this is, I go, you are wrong. You can't say this. It's not true. It's not what the Bible says. And, you know, I'm going on and on and on like I'm, you know, I don't know, someone credible and I'm not. And, uh, and it was great as, as Ray just sort of sat there on a stool and listened, and then he would ask a question. And then I would answer, but not with so much verbosity. Is that a word? I wasn't so, because I wasn't quite sure. And then he'd ask another question, and then I shrank a little more. <laughs> and uh, and what, what I realized, though, is, you know, in, in my bravado, is that I was a sucker. That this is what Ray did all the time. That all he did was bait stuck-up students like me. Uh, <laughs> He was always the opposite of whatever you were. So if you were Calvinist, he was Arminian. If you were, you know, Baptist, he was Pentecostal, you know, whatever. Uh, and and uh, so he, he would do this to students to try and get them into this, into this mode. And he was so just kind and gracious to me and, and didn't embarrass me, even though I felt embarrassed because I realized I didn't have all the answers to all the questions that as a pastor someday people would ask me. How often, by the way, do pastors lash out at congregants when they don't have the answer to a really good question? If only they had had a, a professor like Ray Anderson who didn't lash out back at them, but calmly, collectively, with joy in his heart, love and compassion and mercy, took their students out to Coco's. And that's what Ray did. He took me out to Coco's afterward and bought me some pie and calmed me down. That's a true story. Became a good friend and endorsed one of my books. Anyway, isn't it amazing when we have these memories of mothers and fathers in our life, spiritual mothers and fathers, who, who when we're angry, when we're obstinate, when we're powering up in their experience, their wisdom and love, they, they are peacemakers and joy bringers and servant leaders and teachers. And that's who you are, and I'm so proud of you. I'm actually so proud of this church because... Hannah and I have been involved with a lot of churches. We really have. And I can tell you, not all of them were nice. Not all of them were good. Uh, and in, in all of our experiences, I would say this is one of the most joyful, peaceful, life-giving, Jesus-loving, calm, relaxed churches I've ever been to. And it's, it's one reason I, I love Shepherd's Grove so much. And Irvine Press is the same way. Such loving, calm people. So that's who you are. Mark chapter 10, which Hannah read earlier, this is a passage about what it means to be truly great. The world has its answer, and then Jesus has an answer. First of all, in Jesus' day, he was uh, living in maybe the greatest empire in human history, famous the Roman Empire. And you can see your picture of the Roman Senate. This, was a, this is where all the power came from. This is where people were vying um, for authority, where Caesar was Caesar only because he had an army. It was in Rome, actually, that they would say things like, you're not truly wealthy unless you have a standing army. And so it was really just dog-eat-dog -dog and, and raw power. And uh, this was something that, this was a world in which the Jews, who are now a part of it, uh, were sort of under the thumb of this Roman Empire. So when Jesus talks about the kingdom of God... They are hearing one thing, even though he's saying another. This is a problem preachers have, by the way. Very often preachers will say something and congregants will say, I'm so glad you talked about, you know, and then it's the opposite of whatever the preacher was talking about. And this is, this is, hap and this is what's happening with Jesus preaching. He's talking about the kingdom of God and they're thinking something like Rome, something like Babylon, something like Persia, Somewhere where this guy, Jesus, this rabbi, is going to establish a theocracy, an actual government. And he keeps saying plainly, this is not what I'm talking about. And, uh, and yet, here they are vying for power, for position, for title. And of course, all those things will mean money. So here it comes down in Mark chapter 10. It happens again. 
Then James and John, the sons of Zebedee, they were called sons of thunder, by the way. They were, they were very, like, you know, bold and powerful guys. They came to him and said, teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask. Already, big ego, you see? Like, you're coming to the, the, the guy in charge. We want to give, you know, what do you want for me to do, he asked. They replied, let one of us sit at your right and the other at your left in your glory. And he says, you don't know. And Jesus, the Bible says in Greek that Jesus literally went, <sighs> you know, this kind of thing. He says, you don't even know what you're asking. Can you drink the cup I drink or be baptized with the baptism I am going to be baptized with? He's talking about the, the, the cross, by the way. And of course, without even thinking, these 20-something bravado sons of thunder said, we can't, you know, we can do it. And Jesus said to them, well, you will drink the cup I drink and you will be baptiz baptized with the baptism I am baptized with referring again to not only bap real baptism, but also crucifixion. He says, but to sit at my right hand or my left is not for me to grant. These places belong to those for whom they've been prepared. Okay, then it says, when the ten heard about this, they became indignant with James and John. You know why? Because they wanted those titles. They wanted those positions. They wanted those raises. They wanted that power. And now you've got all 12 disciples squabbling over... Who's going to have the title? Who's going to have the position? Who's going to have the power when Jesus overthrows Caesar? All right. Jesus called them together and said, can we just pause here for a minute? Just, just for a minute. Did you know Jesus, I think, never refers to himself as Christ? He's referred to as Christ. The disciples call him Christ. He affirms that. He, he also, I don't believe, ever calls himself the Son of God. Although, again, he's called that and he affirms those. Jesus almost always calls himself the same thing. You know what it is? The son of man. The son of man. Now, when we hear that, we hear he's a human being. And that's, that is what he's saying. But he's also referencing this very famous passage in Daniel chapter 7. Now, the, the story of Daniel is a, is a wonderful one. I mentioned him, I think, last week where I said there's not a lot of perfect characters in the Bible, but Daniel's pretty darn close. What you see throughout the whole Old Testament is this promise that the son of Adam, which, or the son of man, is going to strike down the serpent. The son of Eve, right? He's going to strike down the serpent. And story after story of the Old Testament are stories of mostly men taking power and lording it over others, defining what is good and evil in their own heart, and then becoming like beasts themselves. So you have this... this sort of theme of beastliness about men as they're pursuing more power, more wealth, more control. And Daniel, finally, in this dream at the end of the book of Daniel, says, I had this dream that those beasts, and it's referring to the nations of Babylon, the nations of Persia, probably the Akkadian Assyrian Empire, these beasts that had trampled everything, destroyed everything that was good, that the Ancient of Days, from his glorious throne, struck them down into the fire, referring to destroying these evil empires. And that then, to, up to the Ancient of Days, there was one called the Son of Man. So there's the Son of Man, this is a famous phrase, who in Daniel 7 steps on a glorious cloud, and the cloud brings him up to a second throne by the Father, where he will rule the nations of the earth, and the nations of the earth will worship him. So when Jesus refers to himself over and over as the son of man, he's referencing this Daniel 7 chapter where God's intent is to put over the world a, a God-man that will, that will rule. Jesus, when he refers to himself in this way, is trying to show them that he's not like other kings and other rulers. And so here he says it plainly. So Jesus called them together and said... You know that those who are regarded as rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them. In other words, they just always leverage their power to get their way. And their high officials exercise authority over them. So he's like, that's what you're wanting to do, isn't it? You want those positions. You want to be the one that lords it over. You want to be the one with power and 
the one with authority and that, like, the way that the Romans do. But he says, not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must become your servant. And whoever wants to be first must be a slave of all. By the way, in, he uses the word slave in Greek. It's doulos. It's the lowest position in the Roman Empire. There's a hierarchy. And at the very, very bottom is the slave, not even a human. And whoever wants to be first must be slave to all. This is these young men, they don't want to hear this. They want power, they want authority, they want position, they want raises, they want glory. And he says, for even the Son of Man, there it is, the Son of Man, the Son of Man, the one who's to sit on the glorious throne that all of the nations will bow down and worship, the Son of Man who will reign with the Ancient of Days, who will bring justice, mercy, and goodness, who will throw the empires of the earth into the fire and raise up uh, you know, the kingdom of God. This one, he said, for even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life away as a ransom for many, to die for the ones that he's serving. Can you do that? Can you drink that cup? Yes, we can, they say. They don't know what they're talking about. They don't know the price that Jesus is asking them to pay. All of this to say that the, the thing we believe as, as Christians, the thing that we're, we claim to hold on to is the opposite of, of what the world views as power. When we talk about the hour of power, we're talking about power that comes through being a servant of all. We're talking about a power that comes from the Holy Spirit, a power that comes from faith, a power that comes from trusting that if I love my enemies, that'll be enough. Loving your enemies is one of the best ways to show that you trust your life to God. Uh, so serving, Jesus tells us very plainly here, is the highest call of any human being, is to serve others. In fact, I believe that this Avodah word teaches us that when we serve others, it becomes worship to God. What if that were true? What if in, in serving as we call them EGRs, extra grace required people, you know, at your workplace? What if instead of doubling down, powering up, leveraging, uh, pouncing back at them, instead you served, loved, listened more, you know, maybe checked in on them later, maybe one, remembered the last time you had a rough day and, and, and didn't want, and felt cornered or trapped. Uh, and you do that, you do that. And uh, you notice that, that the first thing that, that James and John do is they, they want titles and position. And this is the other big deception that many in society teach today is that if you have title, if you have position, that you're a leader. And that's not true. Let me just say this plainly. I mean, this is the most obvious thing I could say in the world, but leaders are not made by titles. Leaders are made by having followers. Anyone can be a leader. If people follow you, if you are influencing people, you are leading them. So let me convince you that wherever it is you work, you can be the change agent. You can be the one to bring the joy, to bring the peace, and to be this, the one who takes the jobs that nobody wants to do. That can be you, and you can make a big difference if you do that. See, I believe that in the church, this is where we get to practice. We get to practice with one another what it means to love people that are different than us, you know, I said earlier, this is one of those peaceful, joyful churches I've ever been a part of, for sure. But we've got a couple crazy people. I understand that. <laughs> I understand that. I'm one of them. And, uh, you know, that's okay. And so when we're here, when we're in this environment, you know, we get the opportunity to practice um, loving one another, uh, caring for one another, serving one another. We get to, in a way, be served ourselves. We get cared for and loved on by others. But the idea is that we bring the unity of spirit, the life, the calmness, the peace uh, into the world. Uh, when we go out, we bring that sense of peace uh, with us everywhere we go. And this gets me onto heresy, something I talk a lot, a lot about in this church, heresy, you know. Just kidding, I never talk about heresy. <laughs> it's so funny how so I just, I don't want, to, don't want to go too far off on the rabbit trail here, but did you know Paul, we always get this image that the early church was just so united and so perfect and everything was so great, and it really wasn't. I mean, Paul was writing to them, you know, talking about all sorts of stuff that was going on in the church that was crazy, and I can't even mention it in church because it's so bad. 
And so Paul is always working for the unity of the church, the joy of the church, the peace of the church, the, the body, not, not a Sunday morning service, but the body of believers loving one another. And actually this word that he used, uh, uh, heretic, it comes from hieratikos, it means one, one who chooses. And I just don't want to get too far on this, but the, the, the heretic under Paul's view is not the person who has false doctrine. And this is something that we miss a lot. We always think, oh, the heretic is someone who doesn't believe in the Trinity or the heretic, right? And, but a heretic under Paul's view is actually someone who causes division in the church. So very often people with a false doctrine, for example, will leverage that doctrine to cause division in the church. You know, I'm a super apostle. So you've got all of these people causing, you know, all this division in the church. Well, the, the hieratikos in all of its context that, that Paul uses it is not someone who has false doctrine. It's someone who's causing division in the church. 1 Corinthians 11, 18, 19, it's division. Titus 3, 10, the person who should be disciplined is the divisive person. And in Galatians 5, 20, this heretic he calls someone who is operating in the flesh. What does he mean by that? It's ego. Someone that's like, I was at Fuller Seminary. I've got it right. You've got it wrong. The heretic, and let me just say this very clearly, although many people split the church with false doctrine, you can have perfect doctrine and be a heretic, according to Paul. This is maybe the, one of the most, the most important thing to Paul is love. He just talks about it over and over, that we love one another. And he warns us, you know, don't preach a gospel other than the one that I preach. He says that clearly, but, but still at his heart is unity in the church, joy in the church. People who love one another because, you know, if we can do that here when we gather, we can bring that kind of compassion, um, mercy, and forgiveness to our neighbors, to our spouses, to our kids when they need it the most. And that's who you are. I'm so proud of you. We don't, we don't need to power grab. We don't need to have big egos. We don't need to stick our chests out. We can be joy bringers, peacemakers, servant leaders. At the end of the day, that's gonna, the fact that you did that at your workplace is going to matter so much more than the fact that you, you didn't get your promotion. The most important thing is going to be that you, you did what was, what was good in the eyes of the Lord and, and, and that, you, that you loved your neighbor even when they're hard to love. And I, you do that. I'm so proud of you. So just three things I would say. Very often when we talk about this servant leader type thing, it comes out as like, try harder, just try harder. But I think you can't, you can't serve what you can't cook. You know what I mean? You, you've, got to, you've got to have it on the inside of you, truly, and not just be trying harder. So the, the first thing I would say is just like, trust God with, what, with that loving your enemy is the smartest thing you can do. Trust God that that these, these ways of serving others is the best life you could ever have. I think it works its way in three ways. Number one, you should be patient. Just, just, you know, practice patience. Don't be in a hurry all the time. Don't always be thinking about the next place you got to go. Just be patient. Be, be slow. Be unhurried in your life so that you can naturally be a, a, a loving presence to people who need it. Second, be Be relaxed. Just chill out. Just relax. Relax. Our, our world is so tightly wound and anxious and jumping to conclusions. And you see it in politics. You definitely see it in religion. It's getting worse. We need people like you who are just chilled out, just relaxed. Uh, in fact, that, that is one of the highest definitions of a leader is probably the most relaxed person in the room. In leadership training, they often call it the non-anxious presence. If you have a room that's on fire and one guy is like, everybody calm down, follow me, this is where we're going, that's the leader. And number three, just trust God. Trust in God's providence when things don't go your way. Just trust that if you really wanted something, you're really going for it with all your heart and mind, that's good, but, but be okay if it, if it doesn't go your way. And trust, that, trust the Lord that maybe it's a grace, maybe God's got something better for you. And if you do those things, I think you're going to be able to be aware of the, the person that so many people ignore at your work and be kind and loving to them. Or, or be kind to the person that's, that's rude or steals your lunch or, or doesn't say thank you, you know, or steals the credit or whatever. We, you can just be above all that stuff. And, and you are, and I, I love you. And thank you guys for making this an amazing church. You just do it every single Sunday. You just create an awesome uh, community of loving people. And it's such a joy to be here. So Lord, we thank you. We love you. We trust you. 
It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you for joining us today. I want to encourage you with something that I feel is so important to understanding how God works through your life. I've discovered firsthand that the responsibility and privilege of transforming someone's life belongs to only one person. That one person is you. You see, together, that means you and I joining as one, our call is simply this, to share God's love through His Word and allow it to transform lives. Bobby and I are so grateful for you. Each and every day we walk in confidence knowing that we are not alone, that our friends and ministry partners are as passionate as we are in making sure that people hear about the love of Jesus. That love through our ministry is leading people to Christ, helping people overcome bad habits and addictions, equipping people to deal with relational struggles, and showing people that there is absolutely nothing impossible with God. As Hannah shared, and I hope it's obvious to you, we love and care about people. And I know that you do too. This month, we are focusing on our ministry partners, which we call our Eagle and Sparrow partners. Today, if you haven't yet joined us as a partner, I simply want to ask you to do so. It's a commitment from you to join with us in monthly giving and prayer, and it's a commitment from us to be great stewards of your generosity and to share the love and hope found in God's Word with as many people as we can through all of our broadcasts and ministry outreaches. For those of you who are already joining with us as Eagle and Sparrow Partners, thank you. Please continue to stand with us and consider doing all you can to make this ministry a beacon of light in a world that really needs the love of God. As you join with us today, we have some really special and encouraging resources to help you grow in your relationship with Christ. With your monthly commitment of $50 or more, join us as an Eagle partner and as our thank you, we will send you our Eagle's Wings mug and coaster set. Plus. Come Alive, 365 devotionals for abundant living, and a bonus living connected video message by Pastor Bobby. Your Eagle's Wings mug will inspire you each morning as you reflect on the goodness of God and His provision in your life. And with this year-long devotional, you'll find daily encouragement that will truly make you come alive and access the abundant life Jesus came to bring. In addition, you'll receive Living Connected, a special bonus video message from Pastor Bobby on the value of living not only connected with God, but with those around you. Or with your commitment of $20 a month, you can join us as a Sparrow Partner. As our way of saying thank you, we'll send you our Sparrow Scripture Card Boxed Set, Come Alive 365 Devotionals for Abundant Living, and a bonus Living Connected video message by Pastor Bobby. This custom Sparrow Scripture Card boxed set includes 50 Scripture cards that will surely inspire you and help you in your faith walk. Call, write, or go online today and become an Eagle or Sparrow partner. Your partnership will make all the difference. The preceding program was paid for by the ministry partners of the Hour of Power and viewers like you and is accredited by the Evangelical Council for Financial Accountability.